All right, so this is the second of the uh, pre-recorded lectures that we're going to do in structural analysis. This is lecture 24. We're going to start uh, beam deflection. Uh, we're going to have a, a somewhat comprehensive example today involving a problem with a single moment function. Um, what we'll do in the next lecture is look at multiple moment functions. And there's not really anything that changes from a theoretical perspective. It's just the, the, the plug and chug, the grunt work that we have to do uh, in terms of the, uh, the integrals. Okay, uh, in terms of just uh, where we're at in the class, the attendance grade should be up to date. Um, uh, I don't, uh, I'm pre-recording this lecture somewhat in advance. I don't know where we're at in terms of the homeworks being graded, uh, but I can tell you that homeworks 5.4 through 5.6, the solutions should be up when this goes live. Uh, homework 5.7 is due today. It is due uh, when this lecture goes live. And then homework 6.1 is going to be due uh, on Wednesday. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to get into our discussion of beam deflections. I want to um, let me go to my PowerPoint here and make sure that we are clear on where we're at. So we're computing deflection of, um, of beams. And in our last lecture, what we had done is all of the background work to derive or to explain this uh, expression. And so it's very akin to what we do for, um, for deflection of trusses. Um, the only difference is that, so, well, I mean, the, the, the method is the same, the formula is a little different, uh, but we do still have uh, a little, in, a, a, a little uh, uh, m and a big M, like we had a little f and a big F. Um, we have real and virtual expressions. Instead of dividing them over EA, we divide over EI because we're dealing with flexure, so we deal with the moment of inertia. <clears throat> and because moment changes uh, across the span, we have to integrate. So instead of summing up terms, we're summing up integrals, okay? So the terms that go into this are the, the big M's are the real moment functions, and those result from the, the original loads on the beam to the beam as it's given. Uh, the little M's are the moment functions from the virtual loads, and so uh, it works the same way that it did um, <clears throat> with trusses. We take all the original loads off the structure, uh, and then we place a single load at the point of interest uh, in the assumed uh, direction, right? Um, if, it, if we're looking for displacements or def, you know, the deflection, the translation, we apply a concentrated force. Uh, and if we're looking for how much the beam rotates or its slope, uh, we apply a concentrated moment. We apply it in the assumed direction. <clears throat> if we get a positive answer, that means our assumed direction was correct. Uh, and uh, if not, that just means our assumed direction was incorrect. Um, e is the modulus of elasticity of the member, the Young's modulus, and then I is the moment of inertia. Now, again, as we, we mentioned at the end of the last lecture, um, the units uh, are not uh, consistent, so we need a conversion factor, and so we have different conversion factors for both deflections and rotations. So for rotations, uh, the conversion factor is 144 to get the units right, but to convert it into a usable um, degrees uh, 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 measurement, um, at least I, I think degrees are a little bit more usable than radians, uh, we would take 144 times 180 over pi. For um, deflections, we just use 1728. And as long as everything is expressed in these units, um, then we should be good. Um, now, we're not going to have to deal with this today, but if we have multiple moment functions, so if we have a beam that has multiple or the need for multiple functions, we're going to have multiple integrals that we need to evaluate. Um, and to explain what I mean by the need for multiple moment functions, um, it, I, I want to talk a little bit about that. Again, that's not going to affect uh, today, and that'll become clear as we discuss the example today. But the need for multiple moment functions is caused by load interruptions. Okay, So if we have a concentrated load present on, on, on the beam, or if we have a distributed load that, uh, that terminates or, or commences and whatnot, then that's going to change the need for a moment function. The, what, what we're getting at when we say moment functions is, if, let's take this beam here. If I take the beam and I plot the moment diagram, so imagine plotting the moment diagram in like Excel. So we know how to graphically construct um, uh, the shear and moment diagram for a structure like this. And with enough work, we could do it in Excel. The question is, how many sections do we have to cut uh, to generate all of the necessary moment functions? And an easy way of doing that is to sort of take your section line and imagine like moving it um, across the beams like the idea is if I moved it a little bit you know across the beam uh, you know when when would the need for a new moment function uh, arise so let me kind of show you what I mean by that um, 
let me get out of my slideshow here. Um, I know it's going to ask for ink annotations. We're going to discard that. Um, let me show you here. So I have a, a notebook pulled up and I just have this beam here. And one of the easiest ways that I think to, to recognize how many moment functions you would need for a problem is to actually sort of do that, actually cut a section. But instead of drawing the image over and over again, what I have here, I just have this like white rectangle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover up the beam and then I'm going to take this white rectangle and I'm going to start sliding it to the right. So, for example, here's you know the beam, and I'm and I'm completing uh, completely covering it. Now, imagine what happens if I slide it over here. So this would be like cutting a section and looking to the left. Maybe I'll put it right there. Okay, if I cut a section and look to the left, what I see is a triangular load, right? That's what I see. I see a beam with a triangular load. Now, imagine if I take this and I move it over, like there, okay. Or, or you know, like right there. So, so here's where it was before, and let's say here's where it is now. So I moved it a little bit. It's still a triangular load, right? So there's no need for a different moment function from here to like here. You can use the same mathematical function to represent that. It's only when we cross past the support that, you know, if I go right here, it's when things start changing. Because everything from A to B, it's still a triangular load. Once I get past this point B, now things start changing, right? Because when I get past point B, now I see not just this triangular load, but I see this vertical reaction of 50.7 kips. And now I start to see this uniformly distributed load, this, this constant load of three kips per foot. And I see that all the way through here. Again, whether I cut a section here or cut a section all the way over here, I still see a triangular load on the left, a distributed load on the left, and a concentrated load of 50.7 kips. It doesn't uh, change until I cut a section over here. Now I see the second reaction and the second uh, uh, triangular load. <clears throat> so if we look at this problem, we ask how many moment functions do we need to fully define the moment diagram for this problem? We need three, okay? <clears throat> for the example that we're getting ready to do, we're only going to need one uh, moment function. Uh, but that's going to be kind of important that you understand that. So again, today's uh, lecture is going to be focused on single moment function problems. Later on, we'll do multiple moment function problems. And they're not harder. It's just making sure that you've, um, that you've done all of your uh, diligence in, uh, uh, in terms of bookkeeping. Because it's all about making sure that you match the right real moment functions with the virtual moment functions and um, uh, 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 carrying all that out. Fortunately, one other thing that's worth mentioning now before we discuss, um, if you're getting a little worried about all of the calculus that you're going to have to do, what we're going to have to do is a lot of definite integrals of polynomials, and that's something that calculators love to do. So we actually don't have to carry out a lot of the integrals by hand. It makes our life a little easier. Okay, let's get back to the um, to the lecture. So make that come on. Okay, so. Um, one of the things I want to uh, mention before we move on is the shear and moment diagrams for concentrated force effects. And this is kind of important to also make your life a little easier. So what I have here are two beam segments. Uh, I've got a beam segment with a concentrated force and I have a beam segment with a concentrated moment. Um, remember, if you have a beam that's subjected to a concentrated force, um, what does the shear diagram and the moment diagram look like? So. If I have a beam with a concentrated force, the shear diagram, and that's all that's on it. it, it so the shear diagram is basically going to be constant, and what that force is going to do is cause a jump in the shear diagram. And so if you have constant shears, you have linear moments. So the moment diagram is composed of lines. Okay, The same thing with the um, uh, moment diagram for a concentrated force effect. You know, it doesn't change the... Um, uh, the, the shear diagram, but the moment diagram is also comp composed of lines, okay? Now they're, they're horizontal lines, but they are straight line segments. So I guess the question is, if you look at the moment diagrams for uh, beams subjected to either concentrated forces or concentrated moments, the moment diagrams are always composed of straight lines. So um, an easy way to find moment functions, or oh, sorry, virtual moment functions, is that they will always be linear. Okay, um, the idea is uh, uh, that because you have a beam, remember when, when we look at virtual structures, we take all of the loads off of the beam and we only put a single load on it, a concentrated force or a concentrated moment. And so the moment diagrams 
are always linear. Okay, so this is going to give us two approaches to derive moment functions. The first is cutting sections, which we're actually going to cut sections for this problem, um, but this can be tedious, um, especially when uh, you have a beam that uh, has some somewhat complex geometry and the moment diagram goes up and down and up and down. Uh, the, 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 it can be tedious to have to cut a bunch of sections. The other thing you can do is just use basic geometry because if they're lines and you need to determine the equation of a line, that's actually pretty easy. Okay, All you need is the slope of the line, which you could compute the slope of, of the moment function, but we actually don't even need to do that because the slope of the moment function is just the shear. We have the slope and we have just a point on the line, we can use y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1 just to you know, compute that pretty easily. Um, so if we graphically construct our virtual shear and moment diagrams, we can quickly derive all of the moment functions just using basic geometry. Um, and I might actually show you how that would work for this example just to sort of illustrate it. Um, but again, I think you're going to find this is, uh, this is really straightforward. It's probably a bit overkill for single moment function problems, but for multiple moment function problems, this can save you a lot of time and also serve as a gut check uh, to see whether or not what you're doing is correct. The other thing I would mention is that I, I have this slide titled An Easy Way to Find Virtual Moment Functions. This will work for real moment functions as well if you have any sections of your real moment diagram that are linear. You, you can just use this too. So. Um, if you are, are not wanting to draw a bunch of free body diagrams and a bunch of sections, this can save you uh, a lot of time. Okay, so I want to get into our example. We have a cantilevered beam with a uh, distributed load. Um, it has uh, It's 15 foot long. It's subjected to 2.5 kips per foot. Uh, the E value is 20,000 KSI and the I value is 1,500 inches to the fourth. So already this is in our consistent units that we've been expressing. These are in the typical units that we would use uh, as civil engineers in the United States. The beam length is in feet, the loads are in kips, the E is in KSI, and the I is in inches to the fourth. That's consistent with how we normally do this. Um, uh, what we're going to do in this problem is determine the vertical displacement and the rotation at point A. So we're going to do both using the, the method of virtual work. Um, I have given you a coordinate system here, so you've got the X and Y axis laid out. Um, I'm doing this for you today uh, for this problem, but later problems you are not given this you have to figure this out yourself and there's actually some tips and tricks for how you should define this to make your life easier um, and in fact I have a lecture devoted to tips and tricks for deflections and that's part of it is how to define the coordinate system to make the math easier for you so we'll, we'll do that uh, later uh, but just know that I'm giving it to you uh, today and for the homework that's going to be assigned associated with this but for um, for the future uh, you're gonna have to do this yourself uh, and then again, I've been saying this before, but I'll say it again, that the terms slope and rotation are interchangeable as well as deflection and displacement. So your textbook might refer to it as slope. I might say rotation. It's all kind of the same thing. Same thing with deflections and displacements. I could also put translations in there. Deflections, displacements, and translations are, are all the same thing. Okay, so let's get into our example. So beam deflection example one. Okay. So um, what we need to do is we need to define some moment functions, okay? Now, um, what we could do if we wanted, we could um, draw the shear and moment diagram, uh, and we could probably do this pretty quickly just to sort of illustrate what's going on here. Um, and we can do this just as a means of making sure that we're on page or on, on par, or that we understand what everything should look like. So. In order to construct the shear and moment diagram, I need reactions. So this is a fixed support. So I think at this point, given the simplicity of this problem, I can probably do this pretty easily just myself. So this vertical reaction ends up being 37.5 kips. And if you're wondering how I did that, it's just sum of forces in the y direction. So um, I have a distributed load going down. I have to have a reaction going up. So it's just two and a half times 15. And as for the moment reaction, I have you know the force times that moment arm. Remember we in the middle. So if I multiply that uh, times its moment arm, I get 281.25. So those are the reactions uh, right there. And so if you wanted to draw the shear and moment diagram, you could. Um, the shear diagram is going to go you know, down. Oops. 
shear diagram is going to start at zero. It's going to linearly decrease down and then go up. It's going to decrease to negative 37.5 and then jump up to zero. And then if you compute the area of that triangle, half of 37.5 times 15 um, is negative 281.25. So if we, so that's our shear diagram. And so for our moment diagram, let me scroll down a little bit. So our moment diagram is going to, you know, this is a linear shear diagram, little to a lot. So it's going to go little to a lot. This is going to go to negative 281.25 and then jump back up to zero. And that's our moment diagram. So that's actually not necessary for this problem, but I thought it's worth going ahead and chugging that out to make a couple of points. Um, number one, it tells us that our moment diagram is a parabola. So we should, when we do the math, we should get a parabola that's x squared or, or has a squared term in it. We also should know that um, the uh, moment at the free end of the beam, at the left end of the beam, is zero, and at the fixed end of the beam is negative 281.25. So we can also check our math to make sure the functions that we derive work. Okay, so it gives us a gut check. Okay. So let's see if we can derive our real moment function. I'll call this M of X, capital M. Now, for now, um, the problems are gonna be structured in a way that it's pretty simple uh, to, to derive these moment functions. And that's sort of the whole uh, uh, spirit of this lecture is that we're dealing with single moment function problems. Um, but they're also set up so that the actual derivation of the functions is pretty easy. That's going to change a little bit, so that's going to make the, the next homework a little bit more challenging. But in order to derive these moment functions, uh, what I need to do is I need to cut a section. Okay, So I'm going to cut a section. We'll call this section 1. And I'm going to cut a section and I'm going to pick a direction to look. Now, before all this discussion about uh, moment functions as they relate to deflections, what we would have done is we would have cut a section and looking at this problem, you know, ask yourself, what's the easiest way to look? Is it to the right or to the left? And it's pretty obvious that it's easiest to look towards the left. Uh, and it's easiest to look towards the left because towards the left, all I have is the distributed load. Towards the right, I've got the distributed load and all these reactions and there's no point in having to deal with all that. You will get the same math, uh, same result at the end of the day, but it will make your life a lot easier to look to the left. But there's actually um, uh, in the, the, the tips and tricks lecture that we do, that I'll do a little bit later, we actually talk about cutting sections and which way to look and there's some more general advice um, related to the coordinate system as to which way you should look. Um, and I'll talk about that later. But for now, the problems are going to be pretty straightforward. So cut a section, look to the left. So what do we have when we cut a section and look to the left? Here's the beam. Here's the section. And then we have this distributed load. And it's 2.5 kips per foot. Now, the length of this segment is x, okay? So that's, if you remember, we had a shear and moment diagram example with the triangular load where we had to cut a section at x. That's what we're going to have to start doing with this. So we're cutting a section at x, all right? Um, collapse this into a distributed, or to a point load. Collapse that uh, into a point load. And so the point load is 2.5x, and then this distance is x over 2. And what we're interested in finding is we have a shear and a moment. We're interested in finding the moment. Now, um, we actually don't need the shear function. You can derive it if you want. Later on, I'll show. I'll talk a little bit about shear deformations and um, how shear deformations might actually affect your answer if you actually use that shear function, but we're not gonna need that uh, today. All we're gonna need is the moment function. So all I'm going to do is some moments at the cut. And it's pretty simple. So what do we have? We have M like that. Uh, and then we have two and a half X is the force times a moment arm of X over two. Pretty straightforward. 
So zero equals m plus, and then two and a half x times x over two is 1.25 x squared. So m is negative 1.25 x squared. So there's our moment function. m of x is negative, let me erase this, negative 1.25 x squared. That's our moment function. That's pretty easy. Okay, and to do some gut checking, does this correspond with the shear or with the moment diagram? What happens if we plug in x equals zero? We get zero, right? This is x equals zero. What about at x equals fifteen? Well, plug in x equals fifteen. What's negative one point two five times? Um, negative 1.25 times 15 squared. So let's see. Boom, negative 281.25. So uh, the function m matches not only the behavior, because remember we said that it should be a parabola and that's a parabola, but it also matches the values. So that is the moment function for this beam. There you go. Pretty straightforward. Now, what we need to do is a second analysis. Remember, the way the method of virtual work operates is you need the real structure uh, uh, analysis and then you need the virtual structural analysis. So what we are going to now need is a virtual moment function. Now, so m of x. Now, if you remember at the beginning of the problem, this problem we're actually looking for two displacements or two, two values. We're looking for the vertical displacement and we're looking for the rotation, both of them at point A. So we're actually going to do two different deflection problems. So we've got the real moment function and then we've got a virtual moment function. What I'm going to say, this is the virtual moment function for displacement at A. Okay, so what that means is we're going to do a virtual moment structure. We're going to do a virtual structure. We're going to do the method of virtual work, and then we'll do another one just to make sure that we're comfortable with the method. Okay, so the virtual moment function for the displacement at A, what that means is we have the structure. We have our fixed end over here. And remember, we place a single unit load at point A. So this is point A. Um, a single vertical load, so we're placing a load here of 1.0 in the direction of the assumed displacement. Now, if I look back at the original structure, I think it's pretty obvious that that's going to deflect downward. So we're going to place a downward load, okay? And remember, this is 15 foot long. So, um, there's our virtual structure, and we need the virtual moment function representing that. Now, what we can do um, is we can do this two ways. So that vertical reaction is going to be 1, and if we have 1 times 15 going this way, we're going to have a moment of 15, it's actually 15 feet, going this way. Okay. Um, first thing I'm going to do is actually draw the shear diagram. So we've got you know, we drop down, go over, oh, let me scroll down a little bit so I'm not squunching here on my screen. So start at zero, drop down to minus one, no change, reaction brings me back up to zero. That's our shear diagram, we'll call that little v. And so actually the units for that are unitless, right, because it's a virtual load, there are no units, okay. And for the moment function, right, the area of this is negative 15, right? It's just a rectangle. So we start at zero, constant shear, linear moment. So that's negative 15. The moment brings me back up to zero. And that's our virtual moment function. And if we wanted to be technical, the units for that are feet. But it actually really does, I'm not as hyper concerned about 
getting the units right because all of the inputs were right. Um, we know that the, the loads are in kips, the lengths are in feet, the E's are in KSI, the I's are in inches to the fourth. So the conversion factor that we derived will take care of all that. So there you go. So what do we know? We know that the moment diagram will be linear. Okay. Now there's two ways of deriving. One is geometry. And this is the new way. Okay. So the new way, we know the slope of that line. What is the slope of this line? Well, the slope of that line is minus one. How do I know that? Because that is the value of the shear diagram. So the slope is minus one. Okay. And the other thing that we need is a point on that line. And the easiest thing to do is to just use maybe that point because the I would propose that the coordinates of that point are 0 comma 0. Maybe the coordinates of this point on this line are 15 in the x, negative 15 in the y. But I'm lazy. I'm just going to use 0 comma 0. So m minus m1 equals slope times x minus x1. I like writing it this way because if you have y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, I don't want to confuse the m's with the moment functions and whatnot, so I kind of write it this way. So m minus 0 equals negative 1 times x minus 0, and I get m is negative x. That is one way of determining your moment function. The other way is to use A section cut and so if I cut a section and I look left just like I did last time so my little V my little M and I sum moments at the cut. So what do I have? Oh, I forgot my dimension. That is x. Right? So if I sum moments, what do I have? I have 1 times x. Oh, let me get my color right. And I have little m. So oh, I'm going to get in the way of my camera there. So 0 equals m plus x, or m is minus x. So either way, we have our virtual moment function pretty easily derived. OK, I can do those boxes a little bit better. That's going to bug me. Come on. You can be neater than that. Okay, I can probably be neater than that, but I think that's good enough. Okay, so now that we have, so let's just scroll and make sure that we're clear on what we've got going on. We did the real moment function, and now we've got the virtual moment function. So now that we have those, we can go ahead and compute the displacement. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so what we're going to do is the method of virtual work. So we've got our real moment function, which I'm going to dispense with the parenthesis like m of x. I'm just going to dispense with that. So we have negative 1.25 x squared, and then we have little m, which was negative x. Okay. So what we can go ahead and do is multiply those. And so little m times big M, if we chug that out, Little m times big M is going to be positive 1.25 x to the third. Okay, We know that E for this problem was 20, um, I think it was 20,000 KSI, and I is 1,500 inches to the fourth. And so if recall, in order to determine deflection, 
you know, this is our, our uh, expression. We are taking integrals and summing them, and that's our expression. Oh, that's our expression for virtual work. Okay, so what we have to do is integrate this, and the idea. Remember, let's let's go back to the to the original concept. The idea is that what we're doing is integrating over the length of the beam. And the reason we're doing that is because we need to sum up all of the energy inside the beam. Remember, the external work done equals the total stored strain energy. So the idea in evaluating my integrals is I need to integrate, sum up the energy across the entire beam. So I propose that we need to integrate from 0 to 15. So I, remember, the beam is 15 feet long. So the deflection at A is going to be the integral from 0 to L of mm over EI. Now, how do we evaluate that? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to integrate from 0 to 15, and we're going to do 1.25x to the third, right, over, so that's where the little m and the big m, so that's where that came in right there, and then EI is 20,000, 1500 dx. Now, before I start chugging anything out, there is one thing that I forgot, okay? And the thing that I forgot is that this whole thing needs to be multiplied by something. What does it need to be multiplied by? This is a deflection computation. It needs to be multiplied by 1728. That will get my answer into a usable term. Remember, the conversion factor for deflections is 1728. And that's my problem right there. And so from here on out, it just becomes a calculus problem. So the way I'm going to handle this is I'm going to factor out all the constants. So remember, you can take all the constants and pull them out of the, the integral. So over here, I'm going to have 1.25 times 1728 over, so actually I don't like using the dots there, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that a little better. So I've got 1.25 times 1728 on the top, on the bottom, 20,000, 1500, so pull all the constants out. And then what I'm left with here is just the calculus. It's just the calculus, just that. So it sort of isolates the arithmetic from the calculus. So I need to evaluate this integral. Now, first off, this you all should be able to do this integral. This isn't all that bad. You know, integral of x cubed is x to the fourth over four. Plug in the top number minus plug in the bottom number. Um, but we do have technology. And so let's see if we can utilize that, top, that, that technology to our benefit. So, so we have this, so let's see what we can do. So if you notice what I'm doing is under the alpha key, we've got this integral, so we'll do that. So we're integrating, let's see, x to the third. In order to populate this with x, over the parentheses, the right parentheses, you can see this x term, so alpha x, and then raised to the third. Then use the right arrow key, 0, right 15, and boom. Yeah, Pretty straightforward, right? And I kind of like isolating the calculus by itself if you can because I think it makes entering it into the calculator a lot easier. Um, but keep in mind, you should be able to do that uh, uh, on your own. So, um, okay. So back to this. So... Uh, when we do this, so this ends up being 12, so here, I'll, I'll, I don't like the commas for numbers this small, so 12, 6, 5, 6 point 25. and again, I just got that from, uh, from, you know, that right here, same answer, so, let's go to this, so, this equals 1.25, 17.28, times 12656.25 and then over 
twenty thousand fifteen hundred. And that's it. So I think you can plug and chug that pretty easily. And what you're going to get when it's all said and done is the deflection at A equals 0 0.911. Okay. And because we utilized our conversion factor of 1728, that is in inches. Uh, and because it's positive, we assumed downward that was correct. Usually when I do these problems, I actually put the unit conversion factors in green to sort of indicate that they weren't part of the original problem. Um, that may be me just being a little nuts with my bookkeeping, but I kind of want to do that just to be consistent. Okay. All right. So there you go. There's your deflection. Pretty simple. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, now for this problem, we had a, another deflection that we wanted to compute. Um, we have the vertical displacement and the rotation, so we need to do the rotation now. Now, whenever you're doing a deformation, whenever you're doing a displacement or rotation, you need two results, a real moment function and a virtual moment function. We already have the real moment function, right? And it works for the entire beam. So one of the beauties is with virtual work is that if you're computing multiple deflections, you only need one set of real moment functions, so we're good there. But we do need another virtual moment function because this virtual moment function is for the displacement at A. We now need a new virtual moment function for the rotation uh, at A. So let's do that. So now we need a virtual, come on, you can, you can write virtual moment function for for rotation at A. Okay, so here's the virtual moment function for the rotation at A, okay? So what we need is we need to go back to our beam and we need to take the beam and subject it to a single concentrated moment, okay? Now the concentrated moment um, in terms of the direction, I'm assuming it's uh, going to rotate like this, okay? Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because if you actually take the beam, let me get my little uh, my, my display here. So imagine that here's the beam, okay? Here's the beam, and I'll try and do this the way that it is on the camera. So the load that you're seeing is on this side of the beam. So if this end is fixed and I'm applying the load, it's going to, am I doing that right? Yes. Sorry, it's kind of weird looking backwards. So, so yeah, so this side's going down. So you can see the way that it's rotating and you can see that it's going to kind of rotate uh, in that same direction. So I'm just picking a direction. But here's the thing, if I pick a direction and I get a negative answer, it just means it was rotating the opposite way. So, so it's pretty straightforward. All right, now again, I'm gonna draw out the graphical moment diagram just to show you. Um, now, if you sum the reactions, there are no vertical forces, uh, so there is a, there there is no vertical reaction, right? The only reaction is um, a moment reaction like this. So it actually might make the shear diag or the moment diagram kind of tricky to construct because if you look, that's the shear diagram, right? There is no shear on this beam at all. This is zero, and that's zero. That's your shear diagram. So there's no area. So you, you, it might actually be kind of confusing to ask, like if you're graphically constructing it, does, do those moments, do they cause, do, they, do I jump up or do I jump down? And it really goes to how the beam would deflect. So if I have the beam and I rotate the beam in this fashion, like I take, like imagine taking your hands and doing that. See how it makes the beam want to do frown, like frowny face? That means it's negative, that's negative bending. So the moment diagram, is going to look like this. Oh, sorry, I'm getting my units wrong. These are these are incorrect, right? This is a virtual shear. This is a virtual moment. So, the moment diagram. Oh, I, I'm every time I get lower, the low part of the screen, I tend to get a little sloppy with my drawings. Let me see if I can redo that. So this is my shear, my moment. I, have, I start at zero, concentrated moment brings me down. 
over, man, over concentrated moment brings me up. So zero, zero, minus one, minus one. So that's your moment diagram uh, for the virtual structure. Let me put my little tick marks on here. I sort of skipped that on some of the earlier diagrams. I'll fill those in later. Okay. Um, if we look at just the diagram, there's no there's no functions or, or anything, no math that we need to do. So I'd say, you know, two ways. I think that's what I used before. I said, you know, two ways. So step one or way one is the geometry. The geometry is pretty easy, right? Because it's just a horizontal line. The moment is constant. The moment is just minus one. The other way of doing it is to do a section cut. And so if I cut a section and I look to the left, And I have my moment there. I'm getting kind of sloppy in my writing. I can do better than that. I know I can. Right? And I sum moments at the cut. Right? So I have 1. I have m. So 0 basically equals m plus 1. Or m equals minus 1. That's it. Um, that's all there is to it. Um, so either way, our moment function is minus 1. And just so you're aware, whenever you derive these moment functions, they're going to be linear functions. So what that means is they're either going to have x in it, like 2x plus 3 or negative x plus 6, or they're going to be constants, right? Uh, m equals 6, m equals negative 1, m equals 0, right? They're never going to be parabolas, right? So it's, it's going to make your uh, life a lot easier there. So either way, there's your function. So what do we do? We just do virtual work again. So let's do the method of virtual work. So we've got our real moment function of negative 1.25x squared. That doesn't change, okay? But now we have a new virtual function and it's negative 1. So our little m, big M is now 1.25x squared. Okay, so positive term. Okay, don't forget we have e of 29 or 20,000 and i of 1500 inches to the fourth and so we use the same concept we are determining the rotation at a so we only have a single integral to do so we're only summing a single integral the integral from 0 to L of M M over E I and so what do we do the integral from 0 to 15 of 1.25x squared over ei times dx. And then, just like before, we have to multiply by a unit conversion. In this case, the unit conversion is not 1728, we're looking for a rotation. So we use one forty four times one eighty over pi. So there you go. So just like before, I think it's kind of beneficial to um, uh, uh, pull out all of the constants. So one forty four. 
180, 1.25 over So then we just have the integral from zero, from zero to 15 of x squared dx. That integral, I'm hoping you can do that on your own. Um, I don't have that one chugged out by itself, but if you do that, you will get 1125. Let's, let's just do that in the calculator. We've got time. Let's just make sure that we're comfortable with that. So. Um, basically, all I'm going to do is I'm going to um, go up to this. Uh, I already did this. I'm going to use my right arrow. I'm just going to hit delete squared. That's actually all I had to do. I just had to change that exponent. Hit equals. And yeah, 1125. So, so there you go. That's all there is to it. So go here. And so, oh, so our answer is just... Um, So 144, 180, 1 1.25, 1125, 20,000, 1,500, and pi. And so what the heck, let's do that one in the calculator too, just to make sure that we're comfortable. So do a fraction. Boom. So 144 times 180 times 1.25 times uh, our integral divided by 20,000 times 1500 times pi, and we get this 0. Point, we'll say 387. So therefore, and we got a positive answer. So therefore, theta a is 0. 0.387. Our units are degrees because we already took that into account with our unit conversion factor. And in terms of the direction, if we go back here, this is how, see how we assumed the moment? We assumed the moment was uh, counterclockwise. We got the correct answer. Uh, or we got the correct assumption because the, the answer was positive. So it is rotating in the same direction as our applied moment. And that's our answer. Again, yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, this I hope I hope you don't think this is all that difficult. Um, now, what is going to be maybe trickier is whenever we have problems that have multiple moment functions that are necessary, and the process is exactly the same. All that's required is just a little bit of bookkeeping to ensure that we um, uh, is a little bit of bookkeeping to ensure that we um, uh, track both um, not just the required number of moment functions, but the ranges of integration because. Uh, this beam, for instance, is 15 foot long. So what we might have is a problem where we have one integral that goes from 0 to 10 and then another integral that goes from 10 to 15. So you just have to track your, um, your integration and whatnot. But yeah, that's all we have. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll do multiple moment functions and you'll see that um, it's not harder, it's just a little bit more. So that's all I got. I will see you all on Wednesday.